Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kylie Hoffert. Um, I'm a family physician here in Edmonton. Um, I was born a BC girl, uh, but moved to Edmonton in 2008 for medical school. And since then, Edmonton has become home for me. So I, I completed my residency in family medicine here at the U of A in 2014 um, and subsequently spent four years working with the military as a medical officer um, while moonlighting at my home clinic at Shifa Medical uh, on the south side of Edmonton. Being one of the only female physicians on base, uh, I kind of developed this niche practice where I saw the majority of um, our female patients who were in the military and learned to do IUD insertions and various other procedures and techniques and stuff. And um, since then, this has become a, a huge part of my my day to day. So um, I'm really quite passionate about women's health and providing safe and effective care for our patients here in Edmonton. I most recently spent some time pre COVID in South Africa, and it was uh, really amazing to try and provide um, unbiased care in a in a country where they have so few resources. Um, and I had this desire to go and see if we could do tons of PAPs and provide IUD insertions. And I realized I was just so out of my realm in that, like, even the basics of providing just education was so, so huge. So, um, so much to learn. I think that's so important. So I'm Gail Kulash, and I'm a nurse practitioner here in Edmonton. Um, I work in two hospitals. I work at the Great Nuns, where uh, I used to have a full-time position. Now I work casual. And, but most of my experience lately has been with my part-time role at the Royal Alexander Hospital. So as a nurse practitioner, we work in collaboration with our physician. Typically, my day starts down in emergency, where we see the patients that were coming in overnight, or we have new admissions coming into the hospital. And so if they're critically ill, part of my role is to go and do an assessment and um, start understanding why they've come in, uh, if there's acute interventions they need to be stabilized, um, and really start the process of honing in on what some of the diagnoses might be and some of the appropriate treatments. And then um, with that paperwork and those detailed assessments, it, uh, the patients are then transferred up in the hospital. be truthful like I don't really recall any formal teaching on gender bias as part of my medical education. Um, I know historically medicine has been a male dominated profession but over the past 20 or so years um, there's definitely been a shift towards equality in medicine and um, I, I realized like looking back on my med school class um, it was really interesting to kind of look at the pictures and see that probably more than half of our class was actually female. Uh, so I think that's um, a defining time in, in history for sure when you look back at pictures on the wall within the, the U of A faculty and seeing that there were very, very, very few women initially and now it, it's become a total shift. Um, I've had so many amazing female mentors uh, who are in leadership positions within medicine and when I was a resident, um, one of my one of my now good friends and um, main mentors uh, was actually the program director of our family medicine program and she was a great role model and then she um, went on to um, become the uh, most recent um, president of the Canadian College of Family Physicians and serves as one of the vice deans of education for our faculty and she's truly been uh, a huge inspiration to me and a great advocate for equality in medicine. Um, and presently our, our Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the U of A is female too. So I, I think defying stereotypes in these leadership roles has been so inspiring and these amazing women continue to challenge me daily um, to push the boundaries of what females can do in our world. I really don't recall any um, particular emphasis on gender, uh, unless you're talking certainly about the reproductive or female women's health issues. But I didn't, don't recall anything particularly targeted. I, I was influenced by feminism. I think I am a feminist, um, certainly with the people I surround myself in Toronto. And so when I went to do my university degree, I did a women's studies course 
which is really interesting um, because we had very limited options in nursing school because it's really prescribed uh, the program. And I remember I was the only nurse in it, which really wasn't, um, I was gonna say it wasn't popular. I was in a typically female gendered role and program um, that kind of subscribed to those old traditions of what careers are good for women. And so if anything, I was seen as kind of like the rock in the craw where there were more women there striving for, different identities. And uh, it was interesting though. I mean, I think when it comes to feminism, we often think there's only one form of feminism. Um, and unfortunately, you know, what I had learned is that even those women that may choose to be ultra conservative can still be identified as a feminist. And um, I do like that any uh, seminars or things I've gone to since have kind of pushed that forward in that feminism isn't necessarily gender bias or gender defined uh, issues as much as inclusion. And, and it seems to certainly stand up a lot for the marginalized uh, people as well and just how we um, identify with people. Truthfully, I don't really think about it that often. I know that globally, these are topics at the forefront of many conversations, but in my day to day practice, I, I try not to really see it as a, a big issue. And I think inclusiveness is so important in medicine and uh, shame and stigma are so commonly experienced by our patients. Um, and so many people in in our communities and more glo like in our more globally in the whole world. Um, but I think having open conversations with patients about their fears and prior experiences certainly helps minimize the propagation of these negative experiences in healthcare. And unfortunately, we can't necessarily change past experiences, but we can certainly work towards shaping the future. I see it a lot in the downtown inner city hospital. I think that our Indigenous population in Edmonton really is overrepresented in the emergency department, um, in some of our addictions programs, in some of uh, the injuries that come in are more secondary to the social issues that they're facing. Um, and so I guess that's what I'm really highlighted to, like, when you talk about healthcare and bias, I. I saw a gentleman yesterday who was homeless and we're hearing of um, our shelters that we have. The shelters have their own challenges. I've, I've had people tell me, I don't wanna go to the Shaw Conference Center because there's lots of drugs and there's violence. And so after that, there's not a lot of options for these people. And um, I did have one gentleman and he does have addictions issue. Um, it's unclear, but end of story, he's got frostbite on 10 digits of his hands. And when I say frostbite, it's, it's like black. He, he will likely lose fingers. And, and it was just a really sad story. It's not only Indigenous. Um, we certainly have others that have similar stories um, where they're a bit more impoverished. Um, and again, they're coming in with health concerns that might have been addressed differently. Um, had they lived in another place, uh, had they had a supportive partner, or certainly if they didn't have addictions, right? And so we find that the health challenges are multiplied and amplified and very layered, which makes it really hard to manage and, and help them to the best that we can. Everyone in our world just seems to try and go through the motions and get through things as quickly as possible. Um, and there's definitely a lot of cultural barriers that shape experiences for both patients and physicians. And um, I think taking the time to have these more sensitive conversations and, and just kind of learn from patients' experiences and, and see how we can develop from that is really important. Uh, there's there's so many barriers and um, I really just think time and openness is one of the big things that we can offer and, and really just learn and kind of take those experiences into the, 
the next patient. Um, uh, times have changed significantly so much over the last like 10 plus years. Uh, inclusiveness and openness um, has become the norm for our newer grads and we try our best to have open minds. And I think that's just a shift in our culture. I think changing the mindsets of our healthcare workers um, from the past is far more challenging, but all we can really do is try our best to remain open and, and just learn. The, the shift from um, doctor-centered care to patient-centered care. And I think that's become, at least since I went through medical school and I'm not that far removed, I, I'm in my sixth year in practice, um, but just the shift toward patient-centered medicine and really learning from the patient experiences rather than kind of pushing our, our own biases onto uh, our patients in, in the system, so. Yeah, it's, it's been neat to be part of this and even to see the difference in the learners coming through um, like two years ago versus five years ago and thinking back to my early days interacting with patients. And like even though I'm not that far removed, uh, you can definitely see that there is a shift happening. Advocate can happen on so many levels. So I think there's different challenges on every level. So I don't think that our government is particularly responsive to advocates and you get to the point where I, I probably don't invest as much time and effort doing any kind of lobbying um, with this government. Sometimes, especially with COVID, all my energy is kind of at the front line. And so my advocating tends to be more for the people that we see. When you ask about patients advocating for themselves, uh, I did have some sort of response within me because there are times when people advocate for themselves and it may be very contradictory to my paradigm. So they may feel that they don't need a particular treatment or they don't uh, want to do something or they believe their rights have been infringed because they're in the healthcare system. And so when they advocate, what, what I'm hearing is a lot of, um, and I'm remembering a lot of aggressive words to nursing staff for what they want. So yeah, that kind of advocating is difficult. You really have to kind of calm the situation and um, meet with them to understand their perspective. And I do find that sometimes we have that power differential where we come in and we think we know what's best. Um, so it's trying to understand, do they really have the capacity to understand their health? because sometimes they don't. Sometimes they lack the education and understanding. Um, there can be a disconnect with values. I think we're seeing that. I'm not sure I've seen it as much, but when it comes to choices, for example, about the flu vaccine, my education tells me that um, the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine are really um, interventions that can help health and health of populations, but that doesn't mean that everybody agrees with it. So when people advocate for it, I think we have to respect it, but sometimes there is a bias in my mind and it can be challenging to meet in the middle. If I'm to think about advocates um, in the Alex, down in Emerge or up on our units, sometimes when you say advocate, it makes me think that those are issues that don't jive with us. Right. So if you're an advocate, that means you're not agreeing with what we're saying anyway. Right. So if this was a patient that was coming in for a pneumonia and uh, had antibiotic treatment and um, all that that entailed, they really wouldn't advocate for themselves if we're going along the same path of their health. What I hear when I hear the word advocate is that there's some sort of divergent in the opinion and they need to articulate that. That was one of my strengths is being able to manage and pull things down to a level where we can talk. But a lot of people don't. And, and I, sometimes it's time. Sometimes there's just too much to do. Sometimes there are biases um, for sure. Um, but yeah, if you're going to talk about collaboration and communication, we all intend it when we walk into work. Like there's no doctor or nurse that says, you know what, I, I'm going to ignore everything my patients tell me. We don't do that. But when you get caught in a situation, sometimes you don't have the time to spend. Sometimes you could really dig deep and it may not be appropriate to dig deep as to why they might be making a decision. 
But, uh, oh yeah, I, I would say communication is a big part in healthcare. And I don't know that we always address it. If a family was to have a challenge with us, HR will be involved or public relations. And then we can get some collaboration, but that is one area they can go to. I actually don't know that it's really as utilized in the other hospitals. It is in Grey Nuns, and I think that's at least one place where they can have a voice. Having learners is, is such an important part of addressing these sorts of things in, in our medicine community. So I'm very passionate about teaching and have a variety of learners in my practice regularly from um, the first days before they start medical school up until they, they finish their residency. Um, so although my practice is very women's health focused and I have a lot of young um, women's and sorry, young women and families um, as part of my patient panel, uh, I think it's so important to um, have both female and male learners involved in my patient's care. Um, initially, when I was first assigned male medical students and residents, I was kind of fearful that my patients would be reluctant to see them and that uh, a lot of the times um, the patients would kind of refuse to, to see a male um, to have sensitive conversations or you just even see them in general just because they were so accustomed to having me as a, as a female um, and that's what they had chosen. Um, I think this own, truthfully challenged my own bias and fears um, because I did have that fear for them. And it had been amazing that my patients were really quite open to seeing somebody um, that they weren't necessarily familiar with before. And they ended up being totally okay with seeing my male students and residents. And um, yeah, it, it really did kind of change my own perception of things. Um, so that has been really cool. Like uh, I have, I'm just, well, my resident right now, he was my first male resident. He's finishing up his second year in residency. So he'll be done quite soon. And yeah, when, when I first got him, I was, I was fearful that um, there would be a lot of experiences that he would miss out on because my patients were so familiar with me and the majority of my prior residents and students being all female. And even yesterday, he was here um, for one of his or one of his days back because he's only with me every couple of weeks now that he's finishing up his training. And he went down to meet a patient who was getting an IUD removal and ended up um, not even really meeting me involved in the conversation at all. So I thought that was really quite neat and um, just patients are so trusting. So uh, as long as they're in a comfortable environment where we've established trust prior and they trust that I'm going to have someone involved in their care who actually wants to be there and actually wants to listen. Um, they've been really open and I commend all of my amazing patients for that. Um, I think also just fostering an environment of openness and trust has been essential and um, just having these conversations and um, so many times, I think in the past learners, like if the medical office assistants or um, the nurses kind of are like, oh, we have a male learner here. Is it okay if they're involved in your care? Um, that people seem to be a little bit more reluctant. But if the individuals kind of go into the room and kind of own it and say like, hey, how can I help you? Like I'm here to, um, to spend some time with you and kind of learn about you. Um, it's really been a different shift. So I think just changing the wording, changing the conversation, being open. And obviously there, um, there are going to be people who are reluctant. So um, if they're not comfortable, that's totally fine. But just trying to be open with the conversations is huge. I'm at the point where the best thing I can do is model and be present and let people know there's a different way of approaching other people. There have been times um, we have, a, again, a lot of marginalized people, a lot of people with addictions, and sometimes there can be attitudes in comments 
um, about those patients that are really kind of derogatory or insensitive. And I, and I caught myself saying it a lot in the last year. And that is, this was somebody's baby, right? You may have this full complete individual with all the, the bumps uh, that life gives us, but they were an innocent baby at one point. And, and I've said that to people and it's like, well, yeah, you know, that's true. It, there is a, a path that got them there because I think they forget. And I think that in order to do the job and um, when it gets tough, it's, it's easier to kind of forget that and just do your tasks. So it's more in my approach, you know, and, and I, I'm pleased that I've had people come up and say, wow, like you, you really did well with that gentleman. He was really belligerent and, you know, um, the, it sounds simple. A lot of nurses and doctors would like to believe they do. I'm not, uh, I, I still think touch is really important. You know, I think recognizing, you know, when, for example, even in addictions, right? If, if they're going through withdrawal, you know, as opposed to just getting the symptomatic um, observations and their comments, it's like, like, this must be tough for you, right? And, and if you can speak to people on that level, I find I get farther. And I think that's really where I try to challenge. So it would be to challenge my practice to not get insensitive and to show others, I think. Honestly, just being open, um, learn from your patients and your learners as they come through your doors. Uh, everyone has different experiences that shape their day-to-day -day navigation of the world. And I think every individual has a unique perspective to share. So the more we can just take that extra few seconds to hear their stories, I think that's huge. There's still a funding discrepancy between women's health and men's health. Um, and, you know, you look at something like ovarian cancer, there is no test for it. You know, typically a person, a woman gets it when it's already advanced. And we've known this for a long time, yet I'm not really certain that we've made a lot of gains as far as funding those things. Um, I think that any kind of support and time and money into some of that uh, research is helpful. I, I even challenge when I was thinking about talking to you, you know, women's health and, and in the Royal Alex, we're fortunate we have um, the lowest hole um, wing of our hospital. Um, there is a focus on women's health, but what do we do when we say women's health? Do we exclude all other health? Like, is it that we're... Um, moving and ostracizing those issues that are typically female away from the general population? Is it that we, you know, if you have to talk about endometriosis and breast cancer and ovarian cancer, that that really has to be shunted that way? Because I think that gives a perception as well to people sometimes. Um, I think people are identifying with the issues they face. I think it tends to be something that people identify with when it becomes close to home, right? So if you're a woman who's had a mastectomy, you're um, certainly going to be impacted by those diseases and you may spend your time advocating for those. You know, a single 20 year old man may not really feel that that's um, something that's important to him, right? Maybe when he's 50 and it's his wife, um, then you start to find that there's some connection with, um, with what's going on for the woman. Because there's, there's a dichotomy, right? There's, in our society, we still have gender washrooms. We still have um, gendered care to some degree, right? So uh, I love my kids and there's a fluidity in culture now. And I hope that that's going to change. I hope there's going to be um, more recognition of a person versus a female or a person versus a male because we do have people that kind of, not just those not even people that self-identify as being um, uh, by gender or um, you know where they choose not to have, have a, a pronoun to identify them I think really the bigger picture is is 
that you can't sum them up because they have breasts and a vagina, or you can't sum them up because they have a penis. Um, that they're more than that. And it would be nice to see that kind of um, permeate healthcare a little bit more. I noticed over the years, we never used to room guys and girls together, females and males. And that's just given the pressures on the system that's that's gone now. We do find that there's often shared rooms just because of um, uh, convenience and resources. And there really hasn't been that many issues for it. You know, I really haven't been um, hearing a lot from the patients that have to share rooms. Uh, nurses certainly, I mean, regardless of who it is, we try to have privacy, but it doesn't seem to be insurmountable like it might have been thought of in the past. Thank you.